Monday, 22 February, 7 p.m. Space is limited because this year, Lebowski rolls in the Ho-Tung Visualization Lab, the Viz Lab at the Ho, at the Ho Science Center. Um, so keep an eye out for that. If you're interested, let Kathy Langworthy or Professor Monk or myself know. Um, we'll be tying that also to our semester kickoff event, social event for PECON, so keep an eye on that as well. The following day, Tuesday, February 23rd, we'll be, holding, we'll be hosting our PECON open house and declaration event for prospective majors and minors, if you are considering the PECON major or minor. This is a great opportunity to meet faculty, to fill out the declaration forms, and to get familiar with the process. It's also an opportunity to meet one of our 80-odd, and they are very odd, uh, majors or minors, and to get their impressions of the program. If you're already a major or a minor, and there's that one course you need to graduate, perfect chance to pre-register for it. So let me encourage you to come and beat the rush. Tuesday, February 23rd, 1130 to 1250, Alumni 111. Of course, there will be the requisite free junk food. Uh, pizza? Yes. Pizza. What could be better? I want to introduce our speaker, Richard Ned LeBeau, by letting all of you who are not professional academics into a secret. Our job, those of us who study politics in an academic setting, is a very strange job indeed. I'm not talking here about the politics of the academy, and I'm not talking about the strange paradox that attends the fact that many of our most insightful comments about politics are made by people that have never engaged in it. I'm referring instead to a particular contradiction that attends the study of politics. Students of social sciences look for patterns in things. We assume that patterns are like the visible tip of a deeper world. Processes that give us processes or rules that help us make sense of things, that helps explain the world better, that explain why things happen the way they do. The assumption that's at work here is something like an assumption taken from natural science, that there is something like unity, coherence, or order in the world. Otherwise, how could a pattern be a pattern? How could it tell us anything? Now, at the same time, most of us know that there is no such unity, that what drives politics is not natural law, but human will. Clausewitz, the Prussian military theorist, says that war is a dynamic interaction of human will and human desire. Now, this puts us academics in a very strange situation. We seek to develop theories based on patterns of events, knowing full well that those patterns may not tell us anything and may not exist. The search may still tell us something useful, but we are using tools at our disposal which are fundamentally ill-suited for what we're trying to do. Think of using the heel of a shoe to pound in a hammer, to pound in a nail because you don't have a hammer. You'll get the nail in. You may break the shoe, but it isn't still really what shoes are for. Now, this is why our jobs are so odd. We are engaged in the pursuit of a thing which we know we'll never find, and if we do find it, we know we've done it wrong. Now, each of us, each of us scholars of political science or politics, deal with this problem in a different way. Some of us focus entirely on practical theory, on finding those patterns and doing something useful with them. Why people commit suicide, why wars happen, what, poverty, what drives poverty rates. Others of us focus on critique, explaining how our colleagues, who thought they found a pattern, didn't really find a pattern, or how if they found a pattern, the pattern doesn't tell them what they think it tells them. These two modes of thinking are fundamentally different at the root, and they divide social science. They have divided social science for almost a century. But a few of us, a few academics, managed to do both at the same time, managed to think in both ways at the same time. Professor, Le <laughs> Professor LeBeau is one of those few. He is a theorist who combines what he calls bench science, the close empirical study of real world problems and challenges with sophrosune, a term he commends to us from the ancient Greeks, Plato and Aristotle. Wisdom, knowledge of one's limits, limits of, knowledge of the limits of thinking and of acting, a sense of introspection. The nicest thing you can say, by the way, this is a great way to, to cozy up the professors, the nicest thing you can say to an academic is that you learned a lot from their books. Well, I've learned a lot from Professor Lebeau's books. I've learned to see nuclear deterrence in a new way. I've learned to think about the Cold War's ending in a new way. I've learned to think about race, racism, and their role in international politics in a new way. But mostly, I've learned to gain an appreciation of how difficult that balance is, that balance between practical theory and self -resuna. how difficult it is to sustain, and how important it is to try. I think it is the most important lesson that we in PECOM try to give. So it's a really, really great pleasure to bring Professor LeBeau to you this evening, to welcome him to Colgate, and to present him to you. Professor LeBeau is the James O. Friedman Professor of Government at Dartmouth College. He is the Centennial Professor of International Relations at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He studied at the University of Chicago, Yale, and the City University of New York, and has authored m rather more books than I would care to recite, including The Tragic Vision of Politics, A Cultural Theory of International Relations, and Forbidden Fruit, Counterfactuals and International Relations. Professor LeBeau.
Um, I hate standing behind a podium, and I'm looking around to see if there's a uh, mic I can pin on. Does anybody know in the back? Maybe we can do this. Otherwise, he's coming with the mic. He's coming with the mic. Good. Well, I'll tell you what, so I don't waste time. I'll start behind here until the mic arrives. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about a book which is in press with Cambridge called Why Nations Fight. Oops. Everybody has other 
If we look at international politics, all of our existing theories and paradigms are rooted in fear, which is what realism is about, but fear of security, need to have military force uh, to use it to demonstrate resolve, or appetite. And liberalism and Marxism, while very different explanations of theories of human behavior, are both ultimately rooted in appetite. There is no paradigm or theory of politics, or there wasn't until I published my book, rooted in thumos, which is badly translated into English as spirit. I turned to Obazilian, which is the prototypical description of a warrior-based honor society, and one that illuminates as well all of the tensions in it, for my understanding of this spirit-based world. Created a paradigm of politics about it, and argued that fear, interest, and appetite uh, are distinct motives, each of which generates a very different logic of cooperation, <coughs> conflict, and risk-taking. Each is associated with a different kind of hierarchical order, and all but fear with a different principle of justice. But all societies, I mean, if you imagine a triangle, that has a vertex of uh, fear, appetite, and uh, spirit, or thumos. All societies live somewhere inside, because they all obviously contain elements of three. Uh, now, there are obviously other human motives, like love and friendship. I don't look at them, because for the most part, they don't affect international relations. And I can explain most of what goes on with reference to these three motives. As societies are mixes of motives, we should expect to see a lot of behavior that can't be squared with a lot of other behavior, in other words, anomalies, contradictions. And most theories simply ignore these contradictions and focus only on behavior which appears to support theirs. Um, I argue that by studying one set of discourses, we can determine where societies are in these mix of values. We can then predict the kinds of foreign policy behavior we ought to see. And then I use a different set of uh, indicators to examine that policy to see how it squares uh, with my uh, predictions. In doing this, I did a whole series of case studies, starting with 5th century Greece and ending up with the uh, war in the Iraq, in which I showed uh, the importance of standing. And I picked cases like World War I, World War II, the Iraq War, which seem to be hard cases for making the argument for standing. First off, because they were <coughs> a world of international relations, not domestic society, where society was very thin, as it is at the international level. And secondly, because these seem to be cases that might be explained on the basis of security. And I made, I believe, a persuasive argument that in fact concern for standing in honor, and I'll explain the difference momentarily, uh, were powerful motives uh, in these cases and in some of the dominant motives. Having made this argument with case studies, I wanted to try to nail it down and to find a, uh, a through a data set of all wars <coughs> since uh, 1648, what's the significance of that data? Westphalia, since Westphalia, which we traditionally take as a standard date for the beginning of the modern state system, uh, to see <coughs> what was the pattern. Uh, was it unique to my case studies, or was it uh, more general? And so you need a data set uh, to try to uh, establish that. Uh, before I describe it and my findings, uh, let me just uh, talk about honor and standing uh, for a moment, because it's the piece of the puzzle uh, which you otherwise uh, wouldn't have. I noted that uh, we build esteem through excelling in activities valued by our peer group and society and winning recognition from men who feel good about ourselves. This is done at an individual basis, but is also <coughs> transferred onto larger organizations. <coughs> sports teams. When our preferred sport team wins, we really feel empowered and good about ourselves. If it loses, the reverse. 
And we know from all kinds of survey studies, if our sports team loses too often, uh, we change our loyalty to a winning team. We want to belong to high status groups huh? because that's how we gain self-esteem. This happens not only with sports teams, but with nations. Huh? So nations act to satisfy not only the appetites and the uh, security of their citizens, but also their self-esteem. And this is a very powerful motive that is done largely ignored. And it's ignored in the modern era because it was associated in the old days with the aristocracies, how it justified itself. And with the French Revolution and mobilization, one way of undercutting the aristocracy was by denying uh, this motive. So it disappeared from the political philosophical lexicon. And I've been bringing it back, although not with, I assure you, any aristocratic controls uh, in mind. Uh, I can bear my working class credentials if, if, if necessary. So honor has to take place in a robust society where there are rules about how honor is achieved, how it's determined who's achieved it, and how it's celebrated. In fact, the Greek word for honor, kleos, is derived from the word to hear. Honor doesn't mean anything unless your praises are sung uh, to others. As competition can get stiff, people often cheat and look for ways of getting on top unfairly. I mean, the Greeks tried to prevent this. This is why wrestling was done in the nude, to make sure that people couldn't grab hold of clothing or do other kinds of ways of, of, of cheating. And speaking of cheating, uh, think about what happens in high schools and colleges, a little cost down here at Colgate. Uh, if a couple of people cheat, well, all right, you know, it's their life, they're doing it. If 30% of the class begin to cheat, you say to yourself, you know, they've got an unfair advantage. I'm being made a chump of by following the rules. So at a certain point, a phase transition occurs, and everybody begins to do this, whether it's driving behavior, cheating at school, uh, there's a certain point where the rules break down, and particularly in areas where things are uh, intense in competition. I, I could go into the banking crisis uh, this way. I won't. So when that happens, we speak about a competition for standing, which is being king of the hill by whatever means it takes. <coughs> for much of history, although not all of history, international politics was dominated by a struggle for standing. States and leaders wanted to be, and still want to be, at the top, because it confers self-esteem to leaders and to their peoples. And this is quite independent <coughs> of, and often sharply in contradiction with what people do to advance their security or their material interest. And I would make an argument, and I'm willing to elaborate on this in the question and answer period, that you can't explain the American invasion of Iraq in terms of either security or material interest. In fact, George Bush Sr. said all of his former advisors and people like Secretary and former Secretary of State Kissinger to plead with his son not to go to war that there was no earthly reason to do so. In fact, it would be possibly likely damaging to American security and material interest. So one has to look elsewhere uh, to explain it. And I'm perfectly happy later to go into where that elsewhere is. So what I've done in this study is to put together a data set. And a data set of wars from 1648 to present that had at least one great power or rising power on opposite sides. So I excluded many colonial wars uh, because even though standing was important, they, they weren't what I was interested in. And I had 96 wars. So the first issue I had to face is what's a war? Because we have legal definitions, real definitions. Commonly in international relations, uh, we consider a war a conflict between states where at least a thousand people lose 
their lives, the war is declared or not. And let me be very clear here that I'm only talking about interstate war, which is a different phenomenon from intra-state war. I'm not talking about civil wars, ethnic cleansing. Uh, this is an equally horrible problem, uh, but it's not the problem I'm addressing in my book, and there are analytical reasons for treating it separately. So I selected wars, and I then asked, uh, well, do they fit into the data set? To do that, I have to know what's a great power was a rising power. And in fact, I had a larger category of states. I had great powers I divided into dominant powers. Every once in a while, there's a state that's primus into Paris, as the United States is at the moment, or uh, Louis XIV, or uh, Napoleon's France was. And this doesn't happen in all periods of history. Sometimes it's not a dominant power. And then there's a great power. And what's a great power? A great power is what other great powers think a great power is. And ultimately, in retrospect, <coughs> states historians call great powers. So I went to five highly regarded uh, diplomatic histories of the period from 1648 to the present and used their definitions of who was about a great power and then made my own choices where they disagreed, but in each case, often a logic pool had encoded it. There's another category among uh, great powers, and that's a declining great power. State that's still recognized as a great power, but on its way down. So for quite a long time, in fact, throughout most of these data sets, Spain, which had been at the top of the world with Philip II, was a declining power. The Ottomans were a declining power. At a certain point, Austria Hungary became a declining power. And the opposite of that are rising powers, lean and mean states, spending lots of money on their military, trying to get recognized by great powers as one of them. Uh, Sweden, Prussia, under the Fredericks, uh, <coughs> Russia, under Peter and, and Catherine, uh, Japan in the 19th century, and the United States, of course, in the 19th and early 20th century, China and India today rising powers and generally seen as such uh, by others. So I use the consensus among contemporaries uh, for coding this. That wasn't so problematic. But then came the question of who initiated war. And yeah, I'd say 90% of the cases this was unproblematic. But there were cases where there were multiple initiators of war, so I had the code multiple initiators. And there were also cases where there were differences of opinion about who had initiated war. <coughs> or a uh, very category was suspect. So think of the Franco-Prussian War. Okay. France declared war on Prussia. So by one criterion, it's France. <coughs> but France declared war because of the Prussian <coughs> Prime Minister Bismarck's famous dispatch from Ems which when it became public, as the Prussians <coughs> were sure it did, put Napoleon III of France in a position where he had no choice but to declare war. So you might argue that really Prussia uh, was the state. So where you have these situations in, for example, 1967, the Middle East War, it's not in my case because it didn't involve great powers, but there too, Israeli preemption. Did Israel go to war? Or was it NASA's occupation of the Sinai that compelled the war. And you could argue it both ways. So I tried to be inclusive uh, and thus had multiple initiatives. More problematic was the reason why states went to war. And here I did something which, to the best of my knowledge, nobody else has. There are a lot of <coughs> studies that say, well, states go to war for territory. And find overwhelmingly they do. But someone else is there. Of course states go to war for territory. <coughs> that doesn't tell you whether they were motivated by security, material well-being, revenge, honor, domestic politics. No. So I tried to have more meaningful categories that reflected these motives for war that I talked about. So security, right, that's a fear-based <coughs> motive. That was one motive for war. Material interest, which is appetite. It's a second basis for war. Standing, 
which refers to the spirit, and revenge, which also refers to the spirit. And then this residual category of other. I didn't have a large number of cases, and almost all of them have to do with domestic politics, with one faction trying to advance its standing vis-a-vis -vis another faction and seeing war as an effective means of doing this. So I coded the initiators by moment. And here, of course, you have to make judgments. In some cases, there's a lot of evidence that suggests why. In others, you have to make inference. Some cases are highly controversial. I really believe World War I, started by Germany and Austria, was motivated by questions of honor. But there are lots of people, in fact, the conventional argument in the literature is that it was motivated by security. And if you're a good scientist, what you do is always lean over backwards in favor of the other side. Because if you can show that you have a powerful case, even when you code to the benefit of the other side, you have a more persuasive argument. So in all of these controversial cases, I allowed multiple codings of voters, uh, recognizing that others had reasonable arguments. And of course, in many cases, <coughs> states like people have multiple reasons for doing these things. So there are more motives uh, than there are wars. And then I look at the outcome. What happened to the, to the people who started war win? And what I wanted to do with the data set was two things. In the first place, I wanted to use it to challenge the existing theories of war, which I think I really did quite successfully. Hang on, I'll say it. And secondly, I wanted to use it to see the extent to which my argument about standing was relevant. So what I did, I derived six propositions from my own theory, or propositions that were germane to other theories. And then I tested them against the data set. And I'm going to report to you uh, what those results were. Uh, before I do, I want to talk about my method for doing this. Normally, with the data set, people engage in various types of statistical manipulations uh, to test to see, in the first instance, whether the data set is representative of the reality as a whole, <coughs> um, and secondly, whether the results are meaningful. I don't do either. I simply use descriptive statistics, and this is by any sophisticated understanding of statistics, the appropriate thing to do. You test to see if your sample <coughs> is representative when you have the sample. And you test it against the universe. I have the universe of cases. I have every war in which a great and rising power or some combination of them were on other sides. So I have no need to see if it's representative. Some people nevertheless do this because they reason that even though you have the universe, you're going to make predictions on the basis of it. And so therefore, you're testing against the future of all possible wars. So therefore, you only have a sample. But I'm arguing that I'm not making predictions on the basis of this because, and I'll tell you why in a moment, the conditions that brought this about are changing. So you can't make predictions on the basis of it. So therefore, I don't need to test it statistically. And the second reason is you want to know if the results are significant in terms of the real world. Well, suppose I argue that 30% of my cases were caused by standing, or 50%, or 70%. What does that mean? There's no objective benchmark of what is meaningful in this regard. I mean, it's all subjective. It's what we think is meaningful. So there, too, there's no reason to test it, rather to report it and let the reader decide what he or she uh, thinks makes sense and what is or is not impressive. So <coughs> let me report my propositions and, uh, and data to you. And somebody remind me of when I started speaking so I don't go on for too long. Anybody remember what I Sorry? About 7 about 7.15. Okay, well, that's good. I'm, I'm well in my, my time. So I never use notes uh, to give talks, but I have no head for numbers. I just can't remember them. I can't even remember my own telephone number. So I'm going to read out the propositions and the numbers um, to you, if I may. All right? 
the first uh, proposition is that the most aggressive states are rising powers seeking recognition, <coughs> right? Because I've argued that traditionally in the international system, the way you become a great power is by decisively defeating other powers. So rising powers are the states who have the strongest incentives to go to war. Uh, or dominant powers attempting to achieve hegemony. Uh, one of the striking features of the modern world, uh, I argue, is that dominant powers who basically have it made are not satisfied and are willing to take great risks to become even more powerful. And often they're great risks because they trigger systemic wars, which in the end lead to their defeat and, and decline. Um, <coughs> Philip of Spain, Louis XIV, Napoleon, Bismarck, Hitler, and of course the U.S. is so powerful that even though it loses its wars, it still remains powerful, but of course it's also uh, followed, followed suit. So that was my, my first proposition. And let me share my results with you. I had 119 initiators of 94 wars, right? That's because I had multiple initiators. Dominant powers accounted for 24 initiations and rising powers for 27. So together they're responsible for 47 of 94 wars or 46% of the total. Well, that may not sound, I mean, it sounds impressive, but not that impressive. But if you think about how few dominant powers there are and how relatively few rising powers there are in comparison to other states. And so you create a weighting where you count every year how many powers of each type there are and you multiply them together uh, and then divide into the total number of war initiations. Uh, then you get an actually a weighted account that says how much they were responsible for. And I won't bore you with the, with the details, uh, but when you uh, do this, uh, they're responsible for almost half the wars, uh, even though uh, they only represent 24% of the total of states. So that, I think, is, uh, is, is a powerful finding and supportive of my view. And, of course, uh, I'll tell you in a moment the ways in which it flies in the face of standard realist understandings of, of what causes war. Uh, my second proposition, ah, let me stay first with, with motives here. I have to take my glasses off to read. Yes, here we go. When we look at uh, the motives for war, huh, there are 107 motives for 94 wars because, as I said, there were multiple motives or I wanted to uh, uh, also include my opponent's uh, uh, motives in these cases. And standing was responsible for 63 wars or 58% of the total. Huh? So this is a cause of war which has been entirely neglected by the literature, and yet it's responsible for basically 60% of wars. And even if you disagreed with a whole number of my cases, it would still be responsible with half, for half of wars. So this is a, a very powerful, neglected uh, cause of war. Security, by contrast, was only responsible for 19 wars, or 18%. Uh, interest, eight wars or seven percent, and revenge, eleven or ten percent. So revenge emerges as even more powerful than material interest, and nobody talks about it as a motive, and only a little less than uh, security. Interestingly, there isn't much variation across the centuries, except for the case of interest. Almost all the wars motivated by interest were in the 18th century. And you don't have them by the time you get to the 20th century, although among smaller powers you occasionally do. If you think about Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, clearly material interest was a very powerful motive. Uh, Iraq was bankrupt. Uh, it wanted uh, its debt rescinded by Kuwait that wouldn't do it. 
by capturing Kuwait, it wouldn't have to repay it, and it would get all of the oil. Uh, very strong uh, economic motive. Now, of course, security is the dominant realist explanation for international affairs. And yet only 18% of wars are motivated by it. This doesn't mean that we should ignore security because, in part, this is an artifact of my data set. I'm looking at who starts wars. If you are the target of somebody starting a war, security is sure as hell your primary um, concern. So it is significant, but not in the way that, um, that realists suggest. My second proposition is that rising powers and dominant powers rarely make war against each other. This proposition is important because in international relations theory it's a very common theory called power transition, which argues that all general wars are caused by power transitions, rising powers that threaten the dominant power. And either the dominant power starts a war, yet prevented war, to either beat the rising power before it only faces it, or the rising power feeling its uh, <coughs> challenges the dominant power so it can remake the system to uh, suit uh, its own goals and interests. And what I find here um, is very interesting that uh, dominant powers initiated 24 wars and rising powers 22. They only fought against each other on two occasions and both are odd cases. Uh, one is where a rising power joined a huge coalition of great powers that were fighting a dominant power. So in fact it was pushed in to join it. And the second is a case where China and the United States went to war in Korea. China was the rising power, U.S. the dominant power. The Chinese did their very best to put the U.S. on notice that if it crossed the 38th parallel, there would be war. The Chinese did not want the war. The U.S. ignored the Chinese warning for a whole range of reasons and got into a war it didn't want with China. So this was due entirely to miscalculation uh, in this case. And interestingly, what I find with transitions is that there are very few transitions historically between rising and great powers in terms of their capabilities. And they, in every case, come as a result of war. They're not a cause of it. So power transition gets it wrong. And this is an important finding because if you think about the current American discourse in how we deal with China, it's all based on the assumption that rising powers traditionally go to war against the dominant power to remake the system. And the question is asked, will China go to war? Now, if there's no power transition theory historically, there's no reason to apply this model to China, quite the reverse. And in fact, I would argue, and I do in the book, that power transition is a Rorschach test. It tells you more about the United States than it does about China. My next proposition is that the preferred targets of dominant and rising powers are declining great powers and weaker third parties. Think about it. If you want to display your mettle, it makes a lot more sense to beat up somebody who you can beat easily, <laughs> and especially if it's a state that has or once had a reputation. So almost everybody who's been a rising power who's become a great power has done so by beating either Spain or the Ottomans. So France went to war against Spain. Right? The United States became a great power by defeating Spain. Uh, Russia, and before that Austria-Hungary, became great powers by defeating the Ottomans. This is the a standard way of doing it. And interestingly, dominant powers don't attack rising powers. They also attack declining great powers or weak third parties because this is an easy way of augmenting your power and displaying um, your military capabilities. So this is a pattern that's completely missed 
by existing theories and one that is historically uh, robust. Proposition number four. Wars between dominant and great powers are most often the result of miscalculated escalation. By miscalculated escalation, I mean that a state goes to war thinking that other states will allow it to wage this war without intervening. <coughs> and yet they intervene. So 1914 is a classic example, but only one of a half a dozen, where Austria-Hungary went to war against Serbia, backed by Germany, convinced that Russia would stay neutral, and of course Russia intervened, which led to Germany invading France, and we had a continental and then a, a world war. <coughs> Rationalist theories would say, well, this has to be the case of lack of information on international environment is opaque. People miscalculate all the time. But it's interesting that every cause of general war is the result of miscalculation. And that the initiators of all of these wars, Spain, France, Germany, lost them. Japan as well. Uh, miscalculation should be like a random curve. It should balance out, but it doesn't. And in fact, if we look at the uh, record of what happens to initiates, 70% of the wars they start, they lose. And I would argue in a significant percentage of these cases, the information was available beforehand that they would lose them. And why does this happen? And this too flies in the face of rationalist theories. They lose them because they don't undertake a careful cost calculus and really examine the evidence. And if you want the most recent example of it, it's the United States and Iraq. The feedback, the intelligence networks were rigged uh, to tell the administration what it wanted to hear. They, as we know, cherry picked information. They relied on sources uh, that were incredible in the eyes of the CIA, but basically told them what they, what they wanted to know. Uh, they didn't allow the State Department to do a thorough investigation of. Uh, although the State Department did, of uh, how an occupation should be conducted. And when the State Department did and sent two copies over to uh, the Defense Department, uh, Rumsfeld ordered them burned. And he did so because they were very pessimistic. He feared that if word had been leaked out, it would undermine public support for a war that he was still trying to mobilize support for before uh, the invasion. So there's a lot of motivated bias that discourages leaders from carrying out any kind of rational calculation. And this is endemic uh, to both uh, not only rising powers going to war, but dominant powers going to war. And that calls into effect balance of power theory as well, which is the other core real estate. Balance of power when the status quo powers have a favorable uh, military advantage is supposed to deter, to discourage, would be challenged. But if challenges never really examine the balance of power very carefully, it can't have a deterrent effect. Uh, and on the whole, it doesn't. But the balance of power does work in a different way. No dominant power that's made a bid for hegemony has achieved it because others have lied against it. So the balance of power doesn't prevent wars, but it does prevent hegemonies but in a very costly way. Proposition 5. That miscalculation of the balance of power 
or the likelihood of escalation has deeper causes than incomplete information. And I've basically just argued that um, with you, and I have a lot of both uh, case study evidence and um, uh, numerical data that suggest uh, that, uh, that this is the case. And I should also add that this really is a fly in the ointment for rationalist theories of war. Uh, the most famous of these is Bruce Bueno de Mosquitoes the War Trap. What the war trap is, it's so easy for initiators to win, so they're drawn into war. But this whole theory is based on false empirical premise. And if one looks at the war started by initiators just since 1945, so the, the, the recent history, uh, initiators have lost 92%. And I argue that more than the majority of the information was readily available uh, that this would be uh, the likely outcome. So what we really need is irrationalist theories of war, not rationalist ones. And that's what I'm trying to provide. And what do I mean by irrationalist? Remember, conflict cooperation and risk taking uh, depend upon what the motive is. And if the motive is honor or standing, uh, then by definition you have to take risks because you can't gain honor without it. And even considering what the cost calculus is may be dishonorable uh, in the eyes of some. So it's not illogical when you consider it within the logic of the motive. And one of the problems with international relations theory is that they consider the economic logic is a universal logic that applies to everything, and that just blinds us uh, to the richness of human motives and the way in which we behave. And finally, if we need uh, more evidence of all of this, let me come to proposition number six, that weak and declining powers initiate wars against rising and great powers. Now, what could be more irrational than attacking somebody who's stronger than you? And in every one of these, uh, I can go back and read the numbers, in every one of these 13 or 14 cases, surprisingly, or not surprisingly, the initiator lost. And in every one of these cases, it was motivated by revenge. The power in question, whether it was Spain, the Ottomans, Austria, had lost territory in a previous war. And it was going to war to get that territory back and regain its honor. And of course, it uh, uh, was ruled by emotions. And once again, didn't undertake a rational cost calculus. So you put all of this together, the two principal findings are that existing theories of war don't take you very far. In fact, they, they mislead you. And secondly, the power of thumos expressed in the form of standing and revenge is very powerful. Uh, Aristotle argues that uh, anger is provoked by slights when others challenge our honor or our autonomy, but that the most anger is provoked when challenges come from people who don't have the status to challenge us. And you think about 9-11. Two Iconic buildings of the United States attacked, not even by a state, by a ragtag cabal of terrorists who only learned to fly straight and, of course, should have been caught uh, right at the outset uh, and weren't. And the anger that arose, which was exploited by the administration, I would argue, for reasons of its own, uh, to go to war. To understand this, one has to get beyond realist, rationalist uh, models. Now, um, in conclusion, let me try to put this in historical perspective for you. And to argue that, as I do in the second part of the book, here's the good news. That all of these motives that have produced wars, and so many destructive wars, are becoming increasingly disaggregated from war. Uh, people are recognizing that you don't achieve them through war. And once that happens, the reasons for going to war not only decline, but the reasons for not going to war increase. And this is a result not of material changes, which is what most people in my profession would argue, but of new ways of thinking. 
And I argue that there have been three ways uh, of radical changes of thinking that have broken across Western civilization in particular, but they've spread elsewhere since the modern era. And the first, and the one that's worked its way through, so it's the easiest to describe, concerns the link between material affluence and war. I mean, it used to be the way people got rich. Empires conquering their neighbors. Pirates, piracy used to be a legitimate activity. Of course, it no longer is, but it's not even the lack of legitimacy. Uh, people don't see it as effective unless it's very extreme circumstances, like the Somali pilots, you know, who exist in a state that's absolutely collapsed, where there's no domestic economy, where there are no other economic opportunities to them, and where the cost of piracy has been relatively low until recently. But here's the revolution. That up through almost the end of the 18th century, people saw and had, from ancient times, the wealth of the world as finite. And that meant that if some other state got rich, you were poor. And going to war to get trading rights or territory was a way of getting rich. Well, along came Adam Smith, Ricardo, and modern economics, and convinced people, and ultimately political enemies, that in fact, the wealth of the world could be expanded through division of labor, through use of mechanical energy, through trade and economies of skin. And as people learned this, they also learned that in fact having wealthy neighbors made you wealthy. If you think Marx says that imperialism was motivated by economic greed, but in fact all the big imperial powers didn't invest in their colonies, they invested in one another. Uh, the economies they knew, the colonies were, were a drain, basically. To make money, you need to be able to predict to some degree in the future. So you want certainty. One of the ways of having certainty is having peace and having norms that regulate relations. So increasingly, people learn that peace facilitates wealth. And contrary to what Noam Chomsky would have to say, in most modern wars from the 20th century on, the principal economic uh, leaders in these countries have been opposed. And even in 1914, all the leaders, even Krupp, uh, advised the German government that peace is in, is in their interest. They, they, they learned the lesson well. And finally, everybody else has. So among the industrial nations of the world, war is unthinkable. And part of the reason it's unthinkable is that everybody knows how destructive it is and how contrary to their interest. So that's the first way of learning that broke over the world. The second concern is security. For time immemorial, it was a nasty world out there. It was the kind of world that we just described. Anarchic, so you had to look after your own security. But people recognized that some arrangement of collective security would be a more efficient, secure way of doing business. And various attempts to create that were brought into being. Uh, most of them failed, the League of Nations being the obvious example. But in some parts of the world, and by some parts of the world, I mean all the industrialized nations of the world, that's a pretty powerful chunk. Uh, that includes uh, most of Europe, all of North America, most of the Pacific Rim. Uh, they have recognized <coughs> to have some degree of collective security, and even if they have the disputes, to resolve them by means other than force. So it's unthinkable, almost, that any of these states could go to war uh, against each other. Uh, this is a matter of learning, and it still hasn't influenced everybody in the world, but it's made much greater inroads than we might have thought 30, 40, or 50 years ago. And now, and here's where I think my book is original, I'm arguing that there's a third wave on the way, which hasn't <laughs> progressed as far um, as the other two. And it has to do with the nature of standing. If you think about it, from time of memorial, how you got to be a great power, and I, I know that's a, it's an historical term, there were officially great powers until after the Congress of Vienna in 1815, but you know how you got to be the, the top dog, if, if you like, was by slashing and burning. 
food made a great public. Huh? And if you go back to warrior societies, which is where this all begins, right? it was the bravest warriors, like Achilles, who had the most honor. Or you could do it through winning athletic contests, which is basically a surrey uh, for war. That is no longer true. For the first time, this notion of how standing is achieved internationally is, I believe, being effectively challenged. Um, if you think about it, the international <coughs> system is really an atomism. Any of your students know what an atomism is? Anyone? An atomism is a holdover from the past that, that, that no longer makes sense in, in the modern world. So think about it. Think how domestic societies have evolved. They've evolved in two very important ways. And this defines modernity in some way. Rather than having one way of achieving honor and standing through your soul, we have multiple ways of doing it. You can even be a political scientist of note. And uh, I mean, that's really stretching and, and, and getting some honor. Or the kind of best spelunker in, uh, in upstate New York or a member of a rock band. Whatever it is, whatever kind of talent and interest you have, you can develop it. And among some group, from local to international, depending on what it is, you can win some degree of respect and therefore self-esteem. So we have multiple hierarchies. And the second way it's changed is that most of these warrior societies, only the aristocracy was allowed to compete, I mean, with rare exceptions. And that used to be true as well in our society. And think about what used to be the most exclusive domains, tennis, golf, and being secretary of state. <laughs> you had to be a wasp. And that was that was it. And think about who have been tennis and golf champs, and who's been Secretary of State and race or gender in recent years. Uh, these hierarchies have opened up. Huh? So this is a dominant and perhaps the most important characteristic of modern society. And then we come to an international system, which is still this atomism, the slashing and burning, uh, is what has made you the top dog. This is now changing. It's been challenged in the past by the French Republic and the American Republic and the Bolsheviks when they took over in Russia who claimed standing on other grounds and to some extent achieved it. But all of them went back to having a big state uh, and using it to become great powers. Now, think about the European community, Canada, um, Scandinavia, Japan, Brazil, all claiming standing but not on the basis of military power. In fact, the reverse. They're claiming it, certainly the Canadians, the European Union, the Scandinavians, on the basis of their wealth. And not just being rich, but using that money wisely to improve the quality of lives of their citizens. And giving a greater percentage of it to other countries to the less developed countries in the world so they can make some economic progress as well. What international politics, I argue, is all about now are these conflicting claims to standing and they're moving away from the use of military force. And as evidence, you can look at public opinion polls and see how respect for the US has plummeted since its use of force first in Afghanistan. And it has nothing to do with the fact that it's meeting opposition because if you look at the polls that were conducted in that short interim between Bush landing on the carrier and proclaiming victory and the rise of the insurgency in Iraq, the U.S. was already sharply on its way down. And even at that point, public opinion in Japan, Canada, and Western Europe evaluated the United States as a greater threat to the peace of the world than either North Korea or Iran. So, What's happened here is the use of force in the absence of international authorization that is in the interest of the world community at large doesn't win you standing, it undercuts it. And leaders in states who are smart have shifted where they spend their resources because everybody wants standing and through standing comes influence 
and one can paint a, a narrative in a world in which the U.S., like the Soviet Union, if it continues to act this way, will become a dinosaur and will continue to lose influence. But right now, it explains why the U.S., the most powerful nation the world has ever seen, is increasingly unable to get others to do what it wants. So I argue that uh, this goes well uh, for the future of, of humankind and to the extent to which we become aware of this process, which I'm trying to flag uh, through my book, will accelerate. And my mentors, people like Hans Morgenthau and Karl Deutsch, believe that international relations should not just be a supporter of the existing power structure, but a transformative project that tried to remake the world into a better place. And so uh, in this sense, I offer my book as one small step in this direction. Thank you. I'm sure you're willing to entertain some questions. Yeah, I am. You know what? I, I know that people have to, some of you have to leave. So anybody who wants to go, go do so. And I'll tell you what, I'll use it the opportunity to take a break myself, and I'll be right back. I want to let the design chief back. Genocide is a modern term post World War II. Uh, we could go far back in history uh, to look at attempts of one group of people to expunge another. And the motives to this vary. Uh, in some cases, it's economic. People want to take over a territory and they expel or exterminate the people who live there. Uh, this kind of uh, killing has gone on from prehistory. Um, to the present. Uh, there is often an issue of security involved. Uh, think about uh, Cromwell's attempt to extirpate uh, the Irish in the 17th century. Uh, 
Ireland consistently rebelled against Britain. Ireland was Britain's first colony, so to speak. It wasn't the Reformation that divided them. The Reformation didn't come to Ireland because colonialism it came with the British. And from Cromwell's perspective, the safest way to uh, protect British security was simply to kill uh, the Irish. So that had a very strong uh, security motive. But if you look, for example, at, um, oh, uh, at, at the genocide that were probably most of the was the Holocaust, the death by the Germans and their various allies in almost every country in Europe to exterminate the Jews, you can't explain that in terms of security or economics. It took a vast amount of resources to do this, trains, bureaucracy, money, at a point where the Germans were even losing the war. Uh, and yet they accelerated their program of extermination against Jews and uh, Roma uh, at, this, at this very time. Uh, there was no economic incentive to do it, even though you know, we all know that it's recently uh, uh, pulling out of teeth and capturing gold from the people whom they killed. Uh, these were uh, among the more productive people uh, in Germany and other societies. And in the First World War, uh, you know, they had fought as loyal German soldiers. They had provided scientists uh, and all kinds of things uh, in support of their native country. So it was utterly illogical, uh, unless you view it, of course, in psychopathological terms, which we must. And, and I stress that because if we ignore the psychopathological explanation in part, then we're left with explanations that allows us, in fact, to explain genocide and to normalize it, which is something we never want to do. But there was a question after World War I of German standing. The Germans were great power. People felt uh, proud of themselves as German because of German power. And self-esteem in Germany, for many reasons, and I write about this in cultural theory, I don't want to go into the details now, was more tied up than in other European countries with Germany's greatness as a power. When that was taken away in 1918 and the Germans were held responsible for the war, uh, there was enormous anger, enormous loss of self-esteem. And many of Hitler's policies which tended to uh, making Germans feel good about themselves and also having uh, scapegoats uh, socialist and Jews on which to blame their defeat play well. So there's a very important element of thumos uh, that comes into play here, but even that uh, can't explain something like, like the Holocaust. That's at least a partial answer to your question. Anybody else? Yes? Um, I was wondering if in your research you, um, there's the democracy feels like democracy theory. Yes. Was that supported or not supported mm -hmm. in your research? Very good question. So the liberal paradigm, its uh, principal claim to fame in international relations, they would say at the moment, is called the democratic peace. And the democratic peace asserts that as an empirical funding, democracies don't fight other democracies. And ever since that alleged finding, uh, which some people argue is the most robust and interesting finding in international relations. Liberals have looked for explanations for why that might be so. Um, let's first look at how convincing the democratic piece is before I address my own uh, theory's relevance to it. Uh, it's hotly contested in the discipline on both uh, empirical and conceptual grounds, right? There are lots of people who argue that it's a mere artifact of the data set. That until recently, there were so few democracies that if you had war at random among states, the number of wars between democracies would be no more than in fact we had. Secondly, a lot of people argue that the people who advance the democratic peace argument is so ideologically committed to it that they fight their data sets. And Bruce Russell is particularly uh, guilty of this, some of So India and Pakistan, which have fought several wars, 
in many of the data sets, they're not coded as democracies, lo and behold, in the years they fought the wars, but they are in the years they've been at peace. Uh, the Boer War, the Boers in South Africa were democratic, and so was England, is not counted as a war because the Boers didn't formally exist as a state. So they ruled out a number of cases that, that might be wars. Uh, so for these reasons, it's questionable. And then there are other people who argue, not surprising since 1945 that you haven't had wars among other countries, because they've all been allies of the United States. And the US has made sure that they didn't fight against one another because it wanted them focused on the alleged Soviet threat. Then you come to the conceptual question. And the conceptual question, what's a democracy? And what's a democracy today? Probably wasn't a democracy 50 or 100 years ago. Was the US a democracy when we had slavery? Was it a democracy when African Americans uh, couldn't vote? Or when women couldn't vote? Well, what, what's a democracy? And what about a democracy would make it peaceful toward one another, but not towards others? And uh, this is you know, debated back and forth. And there's also some empirical evidence that Mansfield and Jack Snyder have argued that New democracies are among the most violent uh, of all states. So it's not clear that there is such a thing as a democratic peace. But to the extent there is, um, I would argue that what explains it is that uh, at least two of the three lessons that these waves of history that I've proposed have been learned uh, most effectively in the industrialized states of the world, which also happen to have democratic orders. And this was in a so-called democratic peace. That is what explains their tranquility vis-a-vis -vis one another. Anybody else? Sure. You argue that it's not necessary for us to try to democratize China to help China to develop economically so that it's in their self-interest to be our partner. Yeah, uh, and China is a very interesting case. Uh, I argue that the power transition theory doesn't really work. And that uh, if we think about China historically, uh, it helps us more to understand contemporary Chinese policy. And let me preface this by saying I know very little about China. I've been there a couple of times. I'm not one of these people who says, well, I'm there for a week. I'm an expert. I'm reporting what leading scholars of China in the field of comparative and international relations argue. So here I'm, I'm reporting to you. This is not my, my argument. The Celestial Empire saw itself as the center of the world and wanted to be recognized as the center of the world. And basically, cut the following year, which is your standard clientelist relationship, which we have in the West as well, with all except for Japan, which is an odd case, Japanese wouldn't go along with this, with, from Korea to Vietnam. Uh, they worked out arrangements whereby these people kowtow to the emperor, acknowledging Chinese cultural supremacy. And in return, China provided real economic and security rewards. And this is the nature of clientelist relationships. We honor those who are above. And they, in turn, do positive things for us. And such a relationship also constrains those who are at the top because the rule package becomes uh, thicker the further up the hierarchy uh, you go. And I think there's lots of evidence, and certainly in the Chinese scholars of China think that China is forging this kind of relationship with its neighbors on the Pacific Rim. Uh, and to the extent to which that's so, uh, then in fact the U.S. both security and economic interests benefit uh, from the rise of China. Uh, there are a couple of uh, confounding factors, of course. The first is Taiwan, uh, which is the odd case because everybody China and Taiwan, most people consider it part, uh, not all Taiwanese, but uh, consider it part of China. And China has staked its honor on unifying China. And so U.S. support of Taiwan creates a problem, and all three sides have been trying to finesse it and cause half. It's been a 
long time since we've had any shelling uh, going across uh, the, the straits. Uh, let's hope uh, that continues. And then, of course, there's also the issue of Tibet. But on the positive side, uh, the Chinese in the last 25 years have increasingly joined international organizations. And in all of them, um, except those involving human rights, get relatively good record marks for how they behave. Uh, a, a good counterexample recently, however, is China's behavior in Copenhagen, where the Chinese uh, basically sabotaged it on the grounds that uh, uh, verification was obtrusive and an infringement on their sovereignty, the kind of arguments that Soviets used to make about arms control. And it remains to be seen what ultimately happens on that score. I suspect that there's a big debate going on in China between traditionalists making the case this is an infringement, Western infringement on our sovereignty, and others in the elite say, do you realize how this is undermining our status in the world? But more fundamentally, uh, China faces a serious crisis in the next decade. Uh, China's economy has a cost in growing. 8 and 12 percent at times, which has fueled uh, this uh, rise of China. But it's done so on the basis of foreign investment and on cheap labor, which comes in from uh, the provinces. So you have, in the first instance, a sharp uh, divide between the wealthy, increasingly educated, and sophisticated populations along the Chinese coast and the Xi'an inland, which is industrial uh, manufacturing center, and all the rest of China. That tension is increasing, and something has to happen. Secondly, look at the Chinese demographic. The Chinese have imposed a one-child policy, and they enforced it in many cases. As a result, they have a greatly aging population without any social security system. We have a problem with the social security system. And how are they going to generate growth at the same rate, given their demographic and their need to support all of these older people. So this phenomenal rate of growth is a thing of the past. It just can't go on. And the Chinese are going to have to face up to all these serious tensions and contradictions in the society, which they haven't until now. And I tell you, I had you know, dinner with the Central Committee of the city of Beijing a uh, year and a half ago one of my former students uh, uh, runs the School of International Affairs in, in Beijing, which is on the Central Committee. And they were perfectly willing to confess several things. First of all, by their estimate, about 250,000 people died every year in Beijing of pollution-related causes. Short-term growth, long-term costs. And secondly, that the communists regime has legitimacy and stays in power only for two reasons. That it produces economic growth, which is going to become questionable. And that it makes China respected uh, in the world. Now, if the economy runs into problems, uh, nationalism can become more acute. And the Chinese found in the last crisis when the US opened the uh, uh, spy plane their public opinion was pushing them toward a more confrontational policy than they thought was in their interest. So they aroused a uh, sleeping dragon, so to speak, to which they're well aware now that they would become a victim. So they have to walk a fine, fine line in addressing this problem. So there are clouds on the Chinese horizon 